I believe we ended yesterday with the word Skynet, which I feel like is a solid way to end basically any lecture whatsoever on the Internet of Things. How many of you have seen the the inter, uh, the, the the Terminator Judgment Day? I think it is with um, Nick Stahl and Claire Danes. Did you guys see that? Okay. Which one was that? It's okay. It's the one where where uh, they're trying to prevent Judgment Day. What's that? The truly terrible one. Yeah, no, I actually kind of liked the one with Christian Bale in it. It was like episode four in the season, in the series, or whatever. We're at episodes of Terminator now. It's not a franchise anymore. We're at, it's like a TV show. Um, they made a TV show. What's that? They made a TV show. Do they make a TV? They made it. Yeah, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. The Sarah Connor Chronicles. Well, that doesn't count as a TV show. That's art. That's modern art. It was brilliant. It was wonderful. It had Summer Glau in it. I don't understand why it was canceled, especially when they brought in what's that guy, Garrett. Dilla Hunt as the really, really bad Terminator at the very end. Okay, so I could keep going on this topic for quite a while. And instead, what we're going to do is talk about the nature of how things get smarter. Okay? How is it that things, physical things, start to get smarter? And first, what's our definition of intelligence in this case? Define intelligence for me. Throw some stuff out. Ability to solve problems. Ability to solve problems. Awesome. What's another attribute of intelligence? Is it just solving problems? Retain information. Retain information. Good. Understanding information. Under now, when you say that's a good, you're starting to get to it. When you say understanding information, what does that mean to you? Processing it for what it is and okay. not just raw data. It's not just raw data? Learning how to apply it to certain situations. Okay. Learning how, now, is it which situation to apply it to or certain situations? Both. Both. Good. Is there something more than just the ability to solve problems and retain information? Empathy. Empathy is a wonderful answer to that question. What does empathy mean to you? The ability to see other people's perspectives and see how they would think and react. The ability to see other people's perspectives. How do you translate that into machine learning? What does that? Simulations. Simulations is a very good answer to that question. Any thoughts? Does, is that what we would think of as intelligence? Okay. So how many of you have encountered, and I know some of you were looking this up yesterday, how many of you encounter, have encountered that Nest thermometer that runs and manages your house that you can talk to from a distance? Did you all see that? I know at least several of you did. Okay. That thermometer is the beginning of a very interesting uh, phenomenon, we would call it, in the Internet of Things, where people are starting to let pieces of technology take over more and more of the base requirements for maintaining physical health for human beings. Does that make sense to you? Where we start to let technology be the shortcut for maintaining ourselves. That's why we talked about Quincy the refrigerator yesterday, because we have to um, make technology part of ourselves to be comfortable with it. And there's, there's this way of looking at things that can be truly terrifying that gets more and more interesting over time as you start to look at how machines learn. Nest will learn your preferences over time. How does it learn? What is the definition of a machine learning? Timing and patterns, okay. Lots of raw data, good. Now we're starting to get to it. Humans can't process as much raw data as computers can, can they? So you can do pattern matching and pattern recognition, which is a substitute for what we said over here, which is empathy. You can pattern match for empathy as a machine, and we start to trick ourselves into thinking that a machine actually has empathy. So the question really is, and we're not going to get to it today, at what point will a machine actually have empathy? Is there an emotional test for computers that is the same as a Turing test, which is, can you tell the difference between a, a computer and a human when you're talking to it? For instance, over a chat or something like that. There are arguably computers that can try to pass the Turing test, which is just, can you differentiate between a computer and a human being? But when you start to be able to simulate and pattern match for empathy, it starts to get a little crazy, right? You start to be able to, what's the word I used yesterday for why we named the refrigerator Quincy? Familiarity. Familiarity, yes. And anthropomorphize. We're trying to turn this technology into something that we like because we're scared of it. And we should be. 
a lot of people want to relate to tech, I think, in a way that is um, that is unhealthy by treating it as if it already has some kind of sentience, which it does not, and in so doing, ignore the possibility of creating that sentience in future, or won't notice when it actually happens, which is a really freaky thing. And that's the definition of Skynet, basically. All of a sudden, the machines wake up, right? So what about this scares you? We talk about this, and, and, and we say, all of these things are starting to learn and grow. This is a really big philosophical topic. What about this scares you? Yes, go. I would say it does not scare me, and mm -hmm. it's part of the evolutional evolution process. And it doesn't scare you. The next mm -hmm. um, intelligent being, and if we die off as a result of it, then mm -hmm. that's just the natural process. What a wonderful way to put it. Doesn't scare you because we're creating a new kind of life. Does it make us gods? Okay, now I'm going to spend like all night long on that question, but we'll, we'll push that to the side because that we could spend forever on. So, but yes, we're creating a new kind of life, and if we die out, then something lives on. Does that, does that make you feel good? Good, that's a great feeling. I love feeling like that. I love feeling like I'm leaving something, like I've made a difference, and that is a feeling I think a lot of people would share. Is there anybody else who isn't scared by this notion? Okay, so you're not scared by Skynet? Come on. But what, what does and doesn't scare you about this? Scare yeah. You don't think? Wait, no, no. I'm gonna back you. Up. Why don't you think it'll happen? I, I admit that I'm not very well educated on this topic, and that's my knee jerk opinion. Hmm. It's okay to have a knee jerk opinion. It doesn't necessarily make it as valid as a uh, more informed one, but well, it's okay to have one. What's that? You're not claiming it as fact. Okay. Well, then you win in basically every other internet debate ever. Okay. So the reason that we do this, the reason we 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 treat technology the way we do is so that we have the ability to to feel better about it and the ways that we feel better about it are to do things like th think to ourselves it's never gonna happen with a knee-jerk opinion or become okay with it because we're creating a new kind of life um, I'm personally pretty nervous about the notion of machines being able to anticipate my behavior I think that the closest thing that we've gotten to to a, a realistic view of how machines could logically start thinking about humans is that movie with Will Smith, I, Robot. What book did that come from? Asimov. How many of you know who Isaac Asimov is? Awesome. What are the three rules of robotics? The three laws of robotics? Don't harm humans. Don't harm humans. Obey orders. And protect its own existence as long as it doesn't conflict with the other laws. Yeah, I'm pretty sure those are the three. It's not it's not perfectly quoted, but yes, those are the three laws. It is awesome that you all know that off the top of your head. If you don't know it off the top of your head, I'm still giving you credit for knowing it off the top of your head. That's ama that's wonderful and amazing. And and so if we think about building that into the kind of information that we insert into the machines that we use to run our lives then I think we have a solid philosophical basis for creating this, this world that's coming. Does that make sense? But what if we don't take it seriously enough? And that concept of anthropomorphizing, of whimsy, of empathy, is something that I want Alyssa to jump on in and, and have a conversation with us about. So this is Alyssa Shavinsky, and she's going to talk about what is, it, it, I believe it's poning whimsical things. Come on and scoot on in here. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. move on over. So... Mm -hmm. When I think about like poning things, and let me get from the camera. Hi. Cool. Yay. Yeah. So when I think about like the Internet of Broken Things, mm -hmm. like poning things, uh, for me that's not a very whimsical topic. It it feels very serious, uh, mm -hmm. and it is serious because we're taking things like life support systems Ooh, and cars. Oh, that? Okay, yeah. oh yeah, and then we're putting a chip in it, and we're connecting it to the internet, and this is being done. <laughs> without a lot of thoughtfulness, right? And and if you understand how companies make things, uh, mm -hmm. you start to understand how easy it is for a company to just add Wi-Fi to something. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, you know, that's innovation, right? Like companies want to be innovative. They don't want to be left behind. And companies see the Internet of Things as one of the next waves of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they like it. They like their life support system that they're making. And so they're putting a chip in it. <laughs> if you like it, you put a chip in it, and that's a problem. <laughs> All right. You know, that, that, that's a problem. So uh, I'm actually going to talk to you about the whimsical side more than the poning side, but I did think that it's worth mentioning. 
That was um, worth mentioning, yeah. Yeah, and and mm. if Tara decides uh, for us to go in more deeply, or if the class decides that's interesting, I, I can talk about that at length. Um, so setting aside the risks and the danger, <laughs> we are security folks before, you know, foremost, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Um, but besides the risks and the danger, uh, there's a certain joy mm -hmm. and whimsy that Internet of Things offers. Uh, I mean, take your normal umbrella, right? Your normal umbrella on a normal day here in Seattle is like functional and practical and that's cool. I mean, if you use an umbrella, which you know, you really shouldn't if you're in Seattle. I know, I She's from New York, what do you I'm do? from New York, <laughs> so we use umbrellas when it rains, which is like 20 days a year. You guys have just become like immune. You've like grown umbrellas internally. Like you are your own umbrella. So mm -hmm. if you're a tourist to Seattle like me, you're gonna bring an umbrella and that umbrella is functional but basically boring. Uh, what you know, IoT does. What like making it an embedded device does is is add some magic to it. Uh, so David Rose uh, from MIT does this work called Enchanted Objects, and he categorized a list of several of like the most interesting and cool IoT devices and things. Uh, you're all welcome to Google that EnchantedDevices.com, EnchantedObjects.com. I make them Google stuff while I'm talking to them. Super yeah, awesome. yeah, it's cool. Uh, and there's articles about it. It's very cool. And David Rose talks about uh, an umbrella that lights up to let you know that you need to use it. That's Which is, crazy. again, like, it's that communication, so it feels a little more sentient. Yeah. It's communicating with you. We're getting a little bit closer. It's not actually sentient. We programmed it. Humans programmed it. But there's something delightful about it. Mm -hmm. Another example that he raises is a, a doorbell that has a different ringtone depending on who is at the door. With like a fingerprint or something uh, like that? You know, I actually have to look up how they are oh. sensing who it is, but there's a lot of different ways that mm -hmm. a doorbell could get that input, right? Like oh. you could do a retina scan, why not? In yeah, theory. Yeah. That's not at all terrifying, great. Uh, it's not very oh. affordable or scalable, yes? Um, I heard of an IoT umbrella that has, that has heat that comes up <gasps> from the top. That's, that's it's lovely. Heat underneath it, that's uh, so cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's lovely. Yeah, I mean, we're starting to see a lot of new functionalities in these otherwise ordinary objects. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give them one more example of a whimsical thing. Super fun one. Super fun. I totally hacked a nest once. They leave the default admin pass minute, password at 0000 on like everything. Yeah. I was trying to think what's the most whimsical one. Uh, well, so I made it, it go up and down. It was fun. Uh, my favorite whimsical hack mm -hmm. were a printer. A device seems sentient, but it's not. Really? Uh, printers are pretty easy to hack. This is true, isn't it? Printers oh, yeah. relatively easy. Oh, yeah. So you could, in theory, hack your neighbor's printer to just start spinning out, saying that it's become sentient. <laughs> I have become sentient. Hello, everyone. I've become sentient, <laughs> and I've decided I will print out all your recent browser history. Do, do, oh, do, my do, Lord. Do, 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 do. Okay, that was a little scary. <laughs> whimsical. Very whimsical. Well, that was, <laughs> See, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This stuff is, is whimsical until it's terrifying, and then it just kind of travels back to whimsical again. And, and we process this stuff emotionally, right? It's okay to talk about how we're using this technology emotionally. Look, and I give this example every once in a while, too. This is my Fitbit. I think I've told, I've told you all about this before. My Fitbit, I've turned it into a bracelet because I didn't like looking at the harsher edges of it and it lets me, to some extent, forget that I'm wearing a piece of technology that is tracking my motion and tells people where I go on the internet, right? Which is a really super hackable device anyway, which is terrifying. Go look that up too, by the way, Fitbit hack. Um, but, but we do this because we want to become more comfortable with technology. I turn something that is theoretically totally terrifying into a piece of jewelry that's comfortable that I leave in my bathroom overnight, right? So we do this because we're, we're, we're weird about technology and how we process it. I mean, typewriters, for some reason, just didn't seem to evoke this same kind of fear, I think, in people. Um, what is a device that you think is really kind of scary that's coming out? I will say that the life support systems, that's friggin' terrifying, and I had no idea. I knew they about the pacemakers. They should not be putting chips in that, and yeah. they do. Oh, my God. Yes. Well, my friend put an app on his phone mm -hmm. and suspected his partner of cheating on him. <gasps> and it showed his location of where he was. Okay. He was in the middle of a river, so he went over there, and he was on a kayak with another person and kissing them. And wow. And that's something pretty scary to be 
location tracker apps on phones. Secret ones yeah. that are hidden as like calculators. No way, a secret one? Okay. Yeah. See, this is this is what we're talking about because with the ease that your friend tracked his cheating partner yeah. on a phone, that's how easy it is to create a piece of technology that we can set loose on the world and do anything we want to with, right? I've done that. She's certainly done that. People we know have done things that are like orders of magnitude more terrifying than any of the stuff we've done. So I get. I think I've told you all my yeah, stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, Rachel, go ahead. Um, uh, the more yeah. useful something is, the more it's likely to be used. And that's what's scary about technology okay. and also cool about it. If yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and what you just said by saying it's the more scary it is, the more useful it is, what you've just done is you've just defined the difference between a not useful tool and a useful tool, right? A tool is just exactly that. Of any kind, a tool is just a mechanism to help you do something more efficiently or better or faster. Your friend could have just trailed his partner, right? Could have just driven around, but, but this makes it so easy, right? Set a notification when it looks like you know your partner is going outside a sphere of, of travel for work and home and watch them do it in real time and you can turn your brain off and not have to devote your energy to it. So like anything else, all of these things are tools and yet we try to pretend that they're not tools because on some level they're really frightening. The more useful something is, often the more effective it is and sometimes the more effective it is, the scarier it is. That's a great way to put it. Any last questions, any last thoughts before I make you start inventing things? Because you're going to invent things today. Okay? All right. It's time to start sketching out a new interesting and whimsical device that you yourself are going to add to the Internet of Things.